Hello and welcome to Let's Play Pathfinder Keymaker Enhanced Edition with me, Bring It Don. So if you watched my last Let's Play of Pathfinder Keymaker, uh, this episode will be very similar to the first episode in that series. Uh, I'm just going to do my character build here and the introductory dialogue at the beginning of the campaign and then call it an episode. Uh, but I will also go over some of the Enhanced Edition changes and at the very end, uh, if you stick around, I will show off the Aldori Sword Lord's tree since you can't see the prestige classes, trees, and character creation for whatever reason. I think that's very dumb. Anyway, uh, so alongside the Enhanced Edition, the final Season 1 DLC was released, uh, Beneath the Stolen Lands. It is a procedurally generated dungeon. Uh, it's an infinite dungeon, you can just play through it. And you can access it here through the new game menu, or through the main story. We'll be playing through the main story, as one of the two new classes that was introduced with the Enhanced Edition. So we're going to jump in. I will be playing it on Challenging, as I did the first time through and with the Varnhold's Lot DLC. Uh, this Let's Play will also have all the current DLC, all three of the uh, Season 1 Pass DLC, as well as Arcane Unleashed, Bloody Mess, and I have one of the Kickstarter packages as well. Uh, some of the changes with the Enhanced Edition, I'll go over that real quick. Uh, they've balanced the game quite a bit. Uh, supposedly the early game is a lot easier now, so if you were struggling before, it should be a lot easier for you to get through it now. Uh, they've made it so that mercenaries uh, can be put into advisor roles, which is really cool. Because I know a lot of people can't stand the default companions, or the story companions. Uh, they've also made it so that you can respec. Uh, it's through the same person that you hire the mercenaries through. Uh, you get three free, I believe, and then everything past those three respecs will cost you more and more gold each time you do it. Uh, they've added some more weapon types, I think just two, the ninchaku and throwing axes, but they've also made it so that the more rare weapon types, like the uh, Dwarven War Axe and Earthbreaker, will have a greater variety that you can find throughout the game. Which is really cool, because last time I used an Earthbreaker, and I found like three variations of the Earthbreaker throughout the entire game, which was super disappointing. And uh, they've added a new enemy type, the Boggard, which is a the frog-like enemy. Uh, they're pretty common in a lot of fantasy games and fantasy settings. And I think that's all the major changes. There's a ton of changes. Like I can't go over, I couldn't possibly go over all of them. Uh, but let's go and jump in. I already know what I'm going to create, so a new custom character. Oh yeah, also, when you update to the Enhanced Edition, if you have any custom portraits, they disappear. Um, they don't just get moved or anything, they, they're they gone. Uh, all my custom portraits are gone, so I'll be using, I guess, this one. Yeah. We'll go with this. He's not going to look anything like my character, but it's an Asimar, so... We'll make do. And yes, I'll be playing Asimar for this. And if you're not familiar with the Asimar, they're essentially half celestial, half humans. Uh, kind of like how tieflings are half human, half devil. And uh, so they get three racial traits. The heritage, which you select a heritage later on. We'll go over that when we get there. It's basically selecting a bloodline, and it gives you a bonus based on that bloodline. Uh, they get a light halo, which is a toggleable ability. While using a halo, they gain a plus two circumstance bonus on saving throws against becoming blinded or dazzled. And they also get celestial resistance. Uh, they get five cold, acid, and electricity resistance, which is pretty good. And I already know how I'm going to build this guy. He's going to be a bronze god. I'm going to go bald because I don't have any hairstyles I'm happy with. There we go. If I was bald, that's what I would look like. All right, so the two new classes that were added, they added one standard class, the Slayer. So you get the Slayer and its three subclasses. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the Slayer. When I hear Slayer, I think Warhammer Slayer. So uh, Dwarves, Orange Mohawks, Slayer Oath. You gotta go out with a bang. Uh, they look like a DPS class at a quick glance. So if you're interested in DPS class, I'm not familiar with them, not interested either. Uh, the prestige class that was added was the Outdoor Sword Lord. 
which really should have been in the game from the get-go, but hey, here we are. Uh, it is a charisma and dexterity focused class, and it's what we're, we're going to be playing through the uh, main campaign with. Uh, it is a prestige class, so you have to meet all these prerequisites before you can select it. Uh, mobility 3, Persuasion 5, uh, World Knowledge 3, Perception 3, Dazzling Display, Weapon Finesse, Dueling Sword Proficiency, and Dueling Sword Weapon Focus. Uh, the Sword Lords follow no singular path to Dueling Mastery. Some of those who take up the blade only dabble in its use, while others explore sword play with their dueling weapon in unconventional ways. So I think the aesthetic for the Sword Lord is the coolest thing. It's the bee's knees. And in order to get there, I am going to follow a route I've taken in a previous Let's Play, in the Barnholds Lot Let's Play, the Outdoor Defender. If you're not familiar with the Outdoor Defender, it is a fighter class, a subclass of fighter. So you get the fighter proficiencies. Uh, fighter is proficient with all simple and martial weapons and with all armor, heavy, light, and medium, and shields, including tower shields. Uh, you also get your bonus combat feat. Uh, fighters get a feat every other level. They actually get a fight feat every level because they're a fighter. And then uh, you get the dueling sword proficiency, which is one of the prerequisites. So we already got one knocked out. Uh, the earliest you can get the Outdoory Sword Lord unlocked is level 6. Uh, by level 5 you'll have all your prerequisites filled out, and then level 6 you can select the Sword Lord. I will also be taking a level into Monk uh, for Crane Style and Crane Wing. We'll, get, we'll worry about that when we get there. There we go. Alright, so for Heritage, I do highly recommend taking the Muse Touched, the Azada Blooded. Uh, the Azada Blooded Osmars have a plus 2 racial bonus to Dexterity and Charisma. Those are your two most important attributes for this build. And a plus 2 racial bonus on Persuasion and Mobility checks, which are, we have to put points into those anyway, so you may as well get the plus 2 uh, to Persuasion and Mobility. Now, persuasion's a big one. Every level we will put points into Persuasion. Uh, mobility, not as much. We'll probably just take the 2, maybe put some more points into it. Anyway, you can use the Glitter Dust spell once per day. That'll be useful pretty early on in the game. Later on it'll probably fall off since we are uh, not focusing on spell casting. So we won't have like spell penetration or the intelligence for it. But it's something else we have up our sleeve in case, you know, it might come in handy. Oh yeah, another thing that came with the Enhanced Edition that I just remembered, uh, the Coup de Gras. Uh, so the Coup de Gras is a finishing ability if an enemy is pr knocked prone or paralyzed, you can take a full round to try and kill them outright. And it's very likely to succeed. So uh, we'll, we'll look at it once we're done building the character. So here, in order to get the Adori Defen- or sorry, the Adori Sword Lord by level 6, uh, these are the- you need to have at least 14 points into intelligence. And you can always take something like Wisdom and Constitution or Strength if you want to. I don't like having a negative modifier, so I try to keep everything at 10. Then you bump this up to 20, and then Charisma up to 15. So the first ability point you get, uh, put into Charisma, so you get that plus 3. Because Dazzling Display is a huge part of this build. Alright, so here I do recommend getting Mobility, Perception, and Persuasion first. And the reason why I like this build for the main campaign is having a high Persuasion and high charisma is really good for the main character of uh, the Kingmaker campaign because uh, there are some points where you are by yourself and you can't rely on your companions charisma checks so so yeah this is ideal if you want to unlock the sword lord as early as possible this is the minimum intelligence requirement that you need so you can allocate all your points because remember you need three into mobility uh, three into world knowledge 5 into Persuasion, and 3 into Perception. And you can, the earliest you can get it, 5 into Persuasion is at level 5. So, Alright, so abilities. Here I recommend taking all your prerequisites that you need. Uh, weapon Focus into Dueling Sword, and then take Weapon Finesse. Because, again, we don't have anything for Strength. It's all, uh, it's all in Dexterity. I did notice uh, something here. So with a Light Weapon, Elven Curved Blade, and Estoc are... Estoc or Rapier, made for a creature of your size, you may use your Dexterity modifier instead of your Strength modifier on attack rolls. But it's funny because once you hit level 5, 
and you select weapon training. If you want to get weapon training for the dueling sword, you have to select the heavy blade option. But here, it says with a light weapon. So I'm... It works. Like, I know weapon finesse works with the dueling sword, but it's weird that it doesn't mention it here. And it's considered a heavy blade under weapon training. But it does work, so if that's something that you caught as well, don't worry about it. It works. Their life ends here. I'm gonna go confident. And uh, someone was making fun of my name. <laughs> they're they're apologetic, but they were making fun of my name and how it didn't sound heroic because I usually select Donald as my fantasy uh, fantasy name. Uh, so I'm gonna go Don Victus. There we go. I mean, that's heroic, right? Anyway, uh, so since I am going to take a level into Monk, I do have to select a Lawful option. I was hoping to do Chaotic Evil this time through, but they came out with the Sword Lord, and that's what I want to play. Uh, so I'm thinking I'm just going to do Lawful Neutral, and just kind of make choices as I see fit. Because uh, last time I did play Lawful Good as a Paladin. So I'm going to try and uh, do something a little different. It's not a whole lot different, as you can see, but... I do have to be lawful. I'm always ready. There we have it. All right, so coup de gras. As a four round action, you can use a melee weapon to deliver a coup de gras to a helpless opponent. You automatically hit and score a critical hit. If the defender survives the damage, he must make a fortitude save, difficulty check 10, plus attacker's base attack, plus melee damage attribute modifier, plus weapons critical modifier, or die. Delivering a coup de gras provokes attacks of opportunity from threatening opponents. You can't deliver a coup de gras against a creature that is immune to critical hits. Yeah, it's, that's going to be very, very useful. But yeah, uh, here's my build. Alright, and let's complete it. We'll jump into the introductory dialogue and then jump into... Uh, I'll show you guys the Sword Lord's tree. There we go. Can't talk. Our story started at the mansion of an Aldori sword lord. Drawn by the promise of a most dangerous task and a commensurately huge reward, heroes of all stripes gathered here. Where are they? This is taking forever! It didn't even say what this was for, just that the Aldori were looking for heroes. Who are the Eldori anyway, rich folk? If you can't be patient, no one's keeping you here. Just go back to your mountains or whatever whore you crawled out of. The Eldori Sword Lords run the premier school for the dueling arts. They're also the richest and most influential group in this part of Brevoy. Take that tone with them, and they'll teach you some manners pretty quickly. All right, you purple toad, just shut your <laughs> trap. And if you can't, I'll help you. Hush! Quiet! They're coming. Greetings, everyone. I am Sword Lord Jamandi Aldori, and this is Lord Mayor Yosef Selimius of Restal. Welcome to my mansion. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for responding to our call. You may be few, but that's unavoidable. We need only the best of the best for this task. And I see true heroes before me, strong and fearless. Exactly what Restov needs. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Now, to the point. South of here, just beyond Brevoy's border, lies a region known as the Stolen Lands. This is disputed territory. And while it's long been claimed by nearby states, it's never been truly taken. I won't bore you with the legal technicalities. Suffice to say that anyone with enough courage and power to seize the stolen lands and name themselves Baron or Baroness, claiming dominion, well, none of the neighboring states would be able to challenge it. Of course, Restoff would be first to recognize the legitimacy of this new state as well as the noble title of its founder. 
Unfortunately, one serious obstacle stands between you and this title. A gang of bandits hold sway in the Stolen Lands. Their chief, who they call the Stag Lord, considers himself the rightful owner of these lands, and no one has yet been able to challenge his power. Bring me his head, and you'll be able to return to the Stolen Lands as their legal ruler. Any questions? Now, there's a whole team of us. Who exactly will receive the Baron's title? I will, of course. I'm the leader of this team, after all. Don't worry, though. I'll make it worth your while to help you. We haven't yet begun, and you already speak of divvying rewards. What makes you think we'll even succeed? There's little point arguing over who gains the title when we'll most likely lose our lives there. <clears throat> if I may please answer the question. Jemani clears her throat loudly, interrupting the argument. She takes a long pause, waiting for the voices to die down as everyone directs their attention toward her. We believe you're all equally deserving of a noble title. Over the course of your expedition, it will be up to you as a team to decide which of you is best suited to rule. Why not just recognize the Stag Lord as Baron? That's a good point. As I see it, this Stag Lord already holds power over the region with confidence. Many noble bloodlines were started by bandits who just got lucky, weren't they? Perhaps because we do have standards to maintain. This room has seen many celebrations of adventurers, and even those who just got lucky. But giving a noble title to a bandit lord? <laughs> That's one thing that's never happened here, and it won't while I still breathe. You're helping us found a barony. What do you gain from such generosity? Don't ask stupid questions. Why should you even care? What they have to gain and why, that's for Lady Aldori and I to discuss. It's none of your concern. Your only concern is to swing your sword around or whatever it is you do. Of course we stand to benefit from this enterprise. But if you're concerned that we intend to rule your country from afar, using you as a front, well, please know that these concerns are unfounded. Let's just say that we have a strong interest in the region's stability. We have need of a ruling power we can negotiate with, not bandit gangs and monster hordes. What is that smell in the air? Is it the smell of unspoken words and political intrigue? I didn't know she was going to be in the beginning of the game. Uh, so she's from the Wild Cards DLC, and when I installed that, I was, I'd already started all the campaigns that I'd already started playing. I didn't realize she was around at the very beginning. That's cool. All right, a tiefling girl is standing nearby, speaking in a hushed voice. Uh, noticing you've heard her comment, she winks at you coyly. Uh, what rewards can we expect exactly? And what reward would you <laughs> seek beyond a noble title and your own lands? Uh, the Lord Mayor's eyebrows raise so far he almost drops his monocle. We'll absorb the costs of preparing and equipping your expeditions. Once you return victorious, Restoff will also allocate you a significant sum to provide financial support for you to establish your country. Essentially, we'll help you build your capital. I hope such a reward is satisfactory. Words, words, words. Significant. Financial. I can't fill my belly with pretty words. Of course. There will also be an official banquet held in your honor. All of Rostov's high society will gather to celebrate your feat. Now you're talking. All right, it's clear as day. Excellent. You venture forth tomorrow. For now, you can take some time to get to know one another better. Or you can head straight to your guest rooms to get some rest. You'll find we've already prepared supplies for you there. And thank you again for agreeing to take part in this expedition. I wish you luck. Thank you again, with all my heart, for replying to this call. The flare in your eyes reveals your courage, the unshakable will that distinguishes true heroes. I look at you, O oh champions of Restoff, and doubt not for a second that you'll be victorious. So venture forth toward your feet, go, and return in triumph. Speaking of slayers, that guy looks like a slayer from Warhammer over there. My name's Lindsay. I'm a bard, though this is my first real adventure. So, shall we go teach this stag lord a lesson? I'm Don Victus. Pleased to meet you. Likewise. Actually, I also wanted to ask you something. How do 
you feel about this Tartuccio fellow? I think he's pretty obnoxious personally. He appointed himself head of the team, and he's just after the Baron's crown, or whatever it is Baron's wear. It doesn't matter. I don't like him. I think you should be team leader. When I first saw you, I couldn't help but think, now here's a real hero. Someone who'll be praised in poems and songs. This... This is the person I'll write my book about. Wait, a book? Damn, I should have led with that. Please, just let me explain. You know what the trouble with most heroes' biographies is? They're always written years later, based on the tales of, best case, people who saw things from the outside. Worst case, someone heard about it from their brother, who heard it from their friend, who heard it from their cousin, and so on, adding a new batch of lies each time. Every time I read about a heroic journey, I think to myself, why didn't they just bring a bard with them to write it all down properly? And then I thought, I could be that bard. I just needed to find a suitable hero and volunteer to follow along on their glorious adventure. A great plan, huh? And here we are, with a heroic journey lying before us. Who's going to be the hero? Some dwarf who keeps muttering about how we'll all die? Or maybe that horrific scythe lady? Or, God's forbid, Tartuccio? No way. What about that barbarian? She looks pretty heroic. I think her name's Amiri. Oh yeah, she's fantastic. You can tell she could tear a bear's head off with her bare hands, but she kind of scares me just a little. But, I mean, her sword's twice as big as I am. She could cut me down without even noticing. Just think on it a bit, all right? I'm sure you'll agree. All right, I'm going to my room to write about tonight. See you in the morning. All right, and I'm going to edit here, and I'll see you guys with the, uh, the Sword Lord tree. Okay, and here we are with the, uh, the Sword Lord tree. We'll just, I'll show you everything that it has. All right, so a Death Strike. Any Sword Lord can add his Dexterity bonus, if any, to damage rolls made with a Dueling Sword instead of his Strength bonus. This bonus on damage rolls applies whether the Sword Lord is wielding a Dueling Sword one-handed or two-handed. A Sword Lord cannot use this ability if he is wielding a shield or using an offhand weapon, including armor spikes, unarmed strikes, or natural weapons. And that's the uh, first level. Second level, you get Display Weapon Prowess. At second level, an Adori Sword Lord adds a bonus equal to half his class level on Persuasion skill checks made to Intimidate. He also gains an additional plus one bonus on persuasion skill checks made to intimidate while using dazzling display with a dueling sword for each of the following feats he has with the dueling sword. Greater weapon focus, greater weapon specialization, improved critical, weapon focus, or weapon specialization. So that's up to plus five bonus on persuasion skill checks made to intimidate with a dazzling display. At level three, he gets defensive parry, or she. At third level, an, Aldor an Aldori Sword Lord gains a plus one bonus to his armor class against melee attacks when making a full attack with a dueling sword. This armor class bonus increases it to plus two at le seventh level. If an Aldori Sword Lord is also a fighter with the Aldori Defender fighter archetype, levels in this class stack with his fighter levels when determining the armor class bonus from this ability. So, Aldori Defender stacks really well with Sword Lord. And then at level seven, you get the upgraded version where it's plus two. Uh, so at level 4 you get Adaptive Tactics. At 4th level, an Aldori Sword Lord learns to adapt his fighting style to counter his enemy's strengths. An Aldori Sword Lord reduces the attack roll penalty for fighting defensively or using combat expertise by 1 at 4th level and by 2 at 8th level. In addition, after a creature attacks an Aldori Sword Lord for the first time, he attempts a perception check, DC equals 10 plus the opponent's base attack bonus. If successful, the Aldori Sword Lord gains a plus two circumstance bonus on attack rolls and to his armor class against that creature until the end of combat. So it is worth pumping up some of your perception as well. And then uh, Adapted Tactics at level eight increases it. Uh, reduces the attack roll penalty for fighting defensively or by using combat expertise uh, by two. So between this and the Monk, because you dip one level into Monk so you can get Crane style, uh, you will receive no penalty for fighting defensively. And then uh, we'll also get Crane Wing, and I'll show you uh, what those do in a second as well. Uh, so level 5, you get Shattered Confidence. At 5th level, an Aldori Sword Lord attempts a Persuasion skill check to intimidate and demoralize his target as a free action after he confirms a critical hit or succeeds at a disarm, or a Sunder combat maneuver with a dueling sword. 
If his target is already shaken, the Adori Swordlord can once per round attempt a persuasion check to intimidate and demoralize the target further after the, any successful melee attack or combat maneuver. If he succeeds at his check, the target suffers an additional minus one penalty on attack rolls and saving throws and loses all morale bonuses to these checks. At level 6, you get Saving Slash. At 6th level, when wielding a dueling sword, an Adori Swordlord can try deflecting a critical hit targeting him, reducing its damage to that of a normal hit, with a 25% chance of success. This does not stack with a fortification special ability of magical armor or similar effects. And at level 9, you get the Greater Saving Slash, which increases the chance to 50% as opposed to 25. Also at level 7, alongside the uh, Defensive Parry, you get Dexterous Duelist. At 7th level, an Adori Swordlord does not provoke attacks of opportunity when standing up from prone. It's kind of, uh, ugh. it's okay, I guess. Very circumstantial. Then at level 10, which every prestige class maxes out at level 10. At 10th level, the penalty from Adori Swordlord's Shatter Confidence increases to minus 2. The target also loses all insight and confidence bonus bonuses to these checks. So this is Shatter Confidence, remember... You get a minus one penalty on attack rolls and saving throws and loses all mor uh, morale bonuses. And then any competence and insight bonuses also get removed. And instead of just minus one, it's minus two. So it's okay. It's a, it's a good, it's an okay debuff class. Um, it's kind of middle of the ground, but I like the aesthetics of it a whole lot. And you will be fighting defensively basically the entire time. So this, cannot continue. Uh, this is why you take a level into Monk. Uh, you'll be taking a level into Scaled Fist Monk, so not only will you get the... Oh, where is it at? The Armor Class bonus. So Scaled Fist is the Charisma-based Monk class. When unarmored and unencumbered, the Monk adds his Charisma bonus, if any, to his Armor Class and CMD. In addition, a Monk gains a plus one bonus to Armor Class and CMD at 4th level, which isn't important because we won't be going that high, but we will be getting the first effect... Uh, when unarmored and unencumbered, the monk adds his charisma bonus to his uh, armor class and CMD. So again, since we're a charisma-based build with the Sword Lord, that's, it all just stacks together very well. Uh, we'll also be taking the Crane-style feat. You take you take only a minus two penalty on attack rolls for fighting defensively. Uh, while using this style and fighting defensively, you get an additional plus one dodge bonus to your armor class. Which stacks with the uh, Sword Lord's ability, which we'll go over in a second. But we also want to take uh, Crane Wing when fighting defensively. Again, we'll be fighting defensively for most of the game, probably post Chapter 1. Uh, chapter 1, since we have such a low chance to hit, we don't really want to take fighting. We don't want to use the fighting defensively too much, um, especially if we're having trouble hitting. Uh, but Crane Wing, when fighting defensively with at least one hand free, you gain a plus four dodge bonus to armor class against melee attacks. If a melee attack misses you by four or less, you lose this dodge bonus until the beginning of your next turn. So what's good about this is it's a dodge bonus, and touch attacks or ranged touch attacks ignore your armor class except for your dodge bonus. So dodge bonus is really good, uh, just in general. Uh, so you want to take both of these feats with the build. But yeah, along with crane style, you get the minus two penalty on attack rolls for fighting defensively. And with the other effect from the sword lord, uh, right here, adaptive tactics, you... Uh, take the fight. So fighting defensively gives you a minus four penalty to attack. But if you have once you hit level eight with the sword lord, and you have the crane style feat, uh, that is a zero penalty to fighting defensively, which is really good. So you just get the bonus to fighting defensively. Which, by the way, in case you don't know, I'm just showing everybody. Uh, fighting defensively, you can choose to take a minus four penalty on attack rolls and combat maneuver checks to gain a plus two dodge bonus to your armor class. If you have three or more ranks in mobility, you gain a plus three dodge bonus to armor class when fighting defensively instead. And again, since we're putting points in mobility, it stacks even higher, you get a higher dodge chance. And between both the feats, the crane style and the uh, feat you get from level eight of uh, the Sword Lord. You take no penalty, and you just get a free plus three dodge bonus, because you have to have at least three points in the mobility to take the Sword Lord class anyway, so you already get that bonus. So yeah, it's just a very defensive build, but it also does good damage. And there you have it. So, I'll show this one more time for anyone who missed it, and that way you can pause it and go over it, if you want. 
Just hover over for a few seconds each one. And defensive parry is also shared with the uh, the duelist. And if I'm going too fast, just uh, feel free to pause it. I mean, I already read it out loud, so. I've done my part. There you have it. Anyway, uh, so next episode, we'll continue with the main campaign. Didn't realize I had that. Cool. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode.